Hi, welcome to those joining us. Um, I hope you've had a fantastic demo day experience so far. We're just wrapping up the first hour where you've seen some fantastic pitch demonstrations uh, and presentations. And in this room, you have the opportunity to ask some questions to uh, the founders. Uh, we have Matt, Matt Owen, who had just completed that presentation there. He's the head of um, Australia uh, and Asia Pacific expansion for Eldo. Uh, we're also lucky enough to be joined by, by Tim and Adam joining us from um, South Africa. Uh, so if you guys would like to introduce yourselves first, uh, then we can kick off this Q&A. Uh, Matt, can we start with you? Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I've decided to take, take the lead of uh, Elder APAC expansion um, when the opportunity to join Startup Bootcamp um, came about. Uh, so, yeah, we, I've, I've been at Elder for the last two years. Um, I've been focused on more of a financial, financial role initially, um, but, but then starting to plug more into the tech side of things. Um, and then the opportunity obviously came about to kind of be part of Startup Bootcamp and I grabbed that opportunity with both hands and um, been working here, uh, developing some, some strong relationships with a bunch of different partners um, and hoping to kind of launch Metastack um, as well as another tool in the, in the near future. Um, Tim, do you want to take over and uh, introduce Eldo from, from the get-go and uh, tell us a bit more about the journey? Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Olsen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Eldo. Uh, I spent the last 12 years in the energy sector focused on energy efficiency, energy management. I migrated more into digital utilities. Um, Eldo has been around for seven years and our business has basically built a whole bunch of software related products in the utility management ecosystem. So we manage lots of data, we do billing, we do payment and digital collections for our customers. And we also provide a whole bunch of user-friendly dashboards and reporting. Um, and that's really how Metastack came to be because we were sitting on a lot of data for, um, from our customers and our various projects. And we thought, what does the future of this data and this data privacy work actually look? And we realized that um, everything that's going on with the big social media giants is obviously the old way of managing data privacy and we thought what would be a more future-proof way of managing utility metering data and that's really how Metastack was born about two and a half years ago as a, as, a, as a concept and obviously Matt has been doing a lot of work since then to really help us kind of develop the idea further and get it to a state where we're very excited and very confident in terms of what it is today and we look forward to developing some interesting and exciting projects with various partners that we have. Thank you very much, um, Matt and Tim. Adam, before I come to you and ask you to introduce yourself, uh, I just want to go over um, just basic instructions for how this Q&A works. So to everyone joining us, uh, you should see a Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen there. Um, if you click that, you can ask a question um, and I will raise that with um, one of the team that we have here today. Uh, if you would like to offer any encouragement, um, any comments, uh, you can do so in the chat as well. Uh, just to you know, let these guys know what a great job they did on um, Demo Day. Um, as we sort of start off this q and I'll get you to introduce yourself as well. Adam, thank you. Um, hi guys, my name is Adam Griffin. I'm the group CEO of Eldo. Um, really my responsibility lies in, in the management and the delivery of our digital utility business in South Africa. Um, as Tim mentioned and, and Matt mentioned, you know, our entire business is based on data. And uh, what we're doing in South Africa and the deployments that we're doing is really uh, working with uh, rolling out a large number of smart meters, um, onboarding a large number of customers and getting them all the way from data acquisition all the way to vend and, and uh, uh, metering operations and management. So really at the call face of being able to understand what customers' uh, troubles are, understanding the customers' needs and relationships and, and what data means for unlocking um, the real customer value in the, in the energy, uh, energy market. And um, Tim, I suppose this is a question for you. Uh, 14 weeks ago, we introduced you guys to the program. Um, it was you know, the beginning of what has been so far a really success, successful expansion into Australia and this region. What was it that initially uh, brought your attention to both the program and um, the Australian market? I think Australia is very exciting from a couple of perspectives. One, uh, the regulator is very proactive and has obviously established a fairly robust market for stakeholders to participate in. 
uh, from a meter, um, it also had some, some pretty decent numbers. So unlike the, the challenges that we face in Africa, there are already a number of, a large number of smart meter installations. So lots of data points that a platform like MeterStack can really thrive in. Um, and thirdly, so South Africa and Australia are very similar. So we thought, you know, that was, would have been a very natural extension for us to expand into another market. Um, and yeah, we, we, I think, picked the right one. Uh, and just as another way of background, Adam has also lived in Australia for a number of years. So it seemed like a very comfortable space for us to start our, our next um, expansion plan. Thank you. And I've uh, just got a comment coming in from, from Tim McCoy there saying, congratulations on a great pitch. It's been great to watch your development through the SBC program. Um, and just on that point there, I think this is a good segue to talk about um, joining the SBC program. Uh, when you first came to Startup Bootcamp, um, what do you think uh, the main aims were? And um, maybe we'll start to talk about the development of those aims and how they might have changed. But start us off with um, your introductory aims to the program and what you were looking for at the beginning. Um, yeah, so I guess we, we kind of joined uh, with a vision of kind of bringing a meter stack to the Australian market. Um, and then things kind of changed over time, but at, just before the program started, we started kind of doing a deep dive into consumer data rights and the upcoming legislation around how that's all gonna work um, and what's going to kind of shape, shape those rules. Uh, so we needed to try and, I wouldn't quite say pivot, but we needed to kind of um, fit meter stack into this evolving ecosystem um, and see how we can kind of develop the product to kind of um, help the growth in this consumer data right era, so to speak. Um, so our initial, our initial focus was always to bring meter stack in and kind of um, incentivize consumers to start sharing their data um, by giving them some upside in those transactions but at the same time, giving, giving the companies that really needed access to the data a way to actually do it. Um, so our, our, I guess our, our narrative or our, our goal hasn't, hasn't really changed. We're still aiming to kind of bring MeterStack to the market. It's just, it's just we need to now adapt to the current legislative um, climate in Australia and kind of fit into that as opposed to uh, just trying to kind of fit into something where, where, the, where the legislation won't really allow for it. And you talk about um, the legislation and how it, how it will change and how we hope that um, you can fit in there to enable um, and empower consumers when it does change. What is it about the um, consumer data right that's such a focus and what is it about um, consumer data right in Australia um, that presents that opportunity as opposed to sort of GDPR in Europe or something like that? Um, so yeah, the consumer data rights in, in Australia, obviously the focus has been on, on kind of open, open financial data for the time being. Um, they're trying to get the rules right there and then the next iteration of that will be opening up C CDR for energy and utilities and then going on to the telecommunications sector. Um, so we've, we've kind of analyzed what has happened around the world in terms of consumer data rights um, and open data and, uh, and we have kind of picked up on, on, on one core uh, issue that keeps on coming up. And, and that is that because consumers aren't really engaged with their data, um, the open, opening up data and, and putting the consumer in control to a certain extent um, does, does shut down the ability for a lot of companies to start accessing that data. It puts up more hurdles and, it, and oftentimes if the rules are, um, are established too soon, um, it can actually mean that they are more restrictive than, than the actual goal of kind of opening up data. So, so we are trying to kind of help shape the narrative around what the data rules should actually look like to, to get consumers engaged in one, in one instance um, where they actually want to kind of participate and share their data, um, while at the same time allowing this, this concept of informed consent where, where consumers aren't really inundated with data requests um, all the time, where it's more on a, on a needs-based um, access. So if they have a specific requirement or something that they want to kind of get out of their data, um, then they can share it and then authorized companies are able to kind of access it as and when they kind of, um, are, when they need to. So, so yeah, we, we, we're looking at a more 
uh, more consumer, consumer upside model, um, while at the same time uh, allowing customers, to, I mean, sorry, allowing uh, um, companies that are operating in the sector to have that access without having to kind of jump through a huge amount of hurdles in order to try and get it and, and, and have the rules almost being more restrictive at the end of the day. So with that aim, and I think, as you said, that's an aim that you've had at your core and um, hasn't changed since you've been on the program. What is it, do you think, about um, the program that has shaped your process of, of going about that? And, and where, where has your um, process led you over the last 14 weeks? Yeah, so obviously with, with being part of the program, we've been exposed to a variety of different companies um, and experts operating in the energy space here in Australia. Um, we've had a lot, a lot of different conversations with, um, with some of the regulators and, and we realized that the, the journey um, around CDR in Australia is going to take some time. Um, the, the, there have been kind of deadlines that have been kind of pushed out uh, when it comes to kind of banking data. Um, and as a result, the deadlines for, for energy data have also been pushed out. So we realized that it's probably a, a, about a, a 12 to 18 month time frame between, before any real rules are established um, in, in Australia around open, open energy data. So uh, with that in mind, we kind of took, uh, took this opportunity to try and look at, at ways where we can actually demonstrate um, real use cases of data and, and demonstrate how data access should look. Um, in order to unlock all of the all of the value that the different startups and different companies operating in the energy sector, all of their value propositions that we'd be helping unlock. So we we just look looking at at, at trying to shape the narrative and, and showing the regulators what good rules um, look like in order to kind of unlock all of this value. Um, so yeah, with that we we we've been kind of focusing on. Uh, one of our one of our projects is is with Gears and Marchmont Hill, um, and we're looking looking to kind of help out in um, in rural areas um, that have been affected uh, by natural disasters, and we're looking to kind of help set up standalone power systems on the back of data. So that's kind of one use case that we really identified as a key problem in Australia that we wanted to try and tackle by putting data to work, essentially. And just before we go into that and unpick the work that you've been doing over the last 14 weeks on the program. Um, I just wanted to remind any new attendees joining um, to pop any questions you have in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the video there. Uh, we've got about half an hour remaining where we'll be going through um, Aldo Meadstack's project work um, on the program. So can you take us through that then? You mentioned talking about standalone power systems and um, your role in establishing them and, and possibly testing feasibility of them. Um, yeah, could you take us through that, that process? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to get kind of Sundar up and Bob, he can, he can uh, contribute. Yeah, I see, I see Sundar is in here. Um, we'll invite Sundar from DS up to the panel. Um, but yeah, just to kind of uh, cover that, we, we, we kind of looked and we spoke to quite a, quite a few distributors um, and they're all they all seem to kind of be having similar problems um, with these kind of fringe of grid areas where, where they, they've been, because in these fringe of grid areas, there needs to be a lot of infrastructure that connects these, these areas to the actual grid. Um, and as a result of a the, the lot of bushfires, um, the maintenance of that infrastructure and um, the costs associated with it have been increasing astronomically of late. Um, and they have to kind of maintain a huge amount of vegetation um, around their core infrastructure that's connecting you to the grid. Um, so with all of that happening, um, one of the recent legislative changes has been to allow uh, distributors to take lead on a lot of these standalone power systems in these fringe of grid areas. Um, so with that in, all in mind and, and, and looking at the experience of what we had done in South Africa, um, I, I, I felt that we were, we were in a position to kind of um, try, try and help out in, in, these, in these kind of developed solutions on the back of data. So I, I kind of uh, had a conversation with, uh, with Sundar and, and Neil from March Hill Consulting, and, and we kind of realized that a, a group effort um, could really be at the core of solve it, solving these problems. Um, so we've kind of set up a consortium to try and help tackle this. 
And we, at the moment, are looking for other strategic partners that will help us um, to kind of get this over the line. Um, but yeah, if Sunno wants to kind of jump in and, and just kind of give a, a, a quick overview of how he's contributing to the consortium, um, it could provide a bit of context. Certainly, thank you, thank you, Matt. And um, you know, it's uh, it's been really interesting uh, working with the the team at, at Eldo and at uh, Marchmont Hill as well. I mean, the I think the, the the problem area that we're or the challenge area that we're that we're addressing here is uh, is, is really quite a unique one. Um, you know, one of the one of the distributors we we spoke to, for example, said that they've got uh, something like uh, thirty thousand kilometres of of poles and wires that are servicing only. Um, you know, uh, and that represents about 50% of their overhead costs, and it's only servicing uh, about 0.5% of their customer base. So, you know, really, this is a, this is an area where you know affordability and reliability are, are really key. And uh, so, working with the Eldo team, you know, we're looking at combining data from uh, a DS innovation called the Power Sensor, which um, allows you to capture energy uh, consumed and energy generated from uh, from any type of meter, um, analog or smart, um, and and often these these um, you know fringe of grid areas uh, are not covered by smart meters, and hence uh, having a low cost self installed um, uh, uh, mechanism to capture uh, uh, data is is really really important. You can't necessarily buzz out a an engineer on a Cessna out to these rural sites. Um, so um, being able to you know be able to simply post the the the, the sensors in the in in, in the, you know through Australia Post and get it out there and have um, a very uh, uh, simple way for the the homeowner or, or site owner to install it is 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 really key and that that's how we're contributing there. We're also able to capture the in, uh, information from uh, solar generation um, uh, uh, in any type of inverter as well. So we're we're, we're teaming up there to provide this, you know, low cost, you know, high convenience uh, model of, of capturing information and, uh, and feeding that to the, you know, the smart algorithms that the, the elder guys have developed uh, through MetaStack and Spark. Yeah, thanks very much Sundar for kind of sure. um, adding some value there. Um, yeah, so as you said, we, we have kind of set up this consortium, Marchmont Hill um, Consulting, they, they're an energy focused consultancy company um, and we're working with them and Sunda at the moment to try and uh, get some arena funding over the line um, to kind of develop this tool and, um, and, yeah, and provide value to, to these communities um, as well as distributors alike. So um, at, the, yeah, at the moment, we've had some positive feedback from arena. Uh, we are just looking for kind of a distributor to get involved with the project. Um, we, have, uh, we have been speaking to a couple um, and they definitely seem interested because this is a real problem that they're currently being faced. Um, they haven't really up until now had the, had the ability to, to really kind of tackle this problem as a result of um, limit, limitations in terms of legislation. But this, this now opens it up for them. Um, so they are quite excited about the opportunity and, and if someone is able to kind of provide uh, a solution for that, um, they, they're quite excited about the opportunity. Absolutely. And I think, as you just touched on there, the fact that the, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, um, have got um, this money to, to invest in, um, in strengthening the grid and looking at alternatives to poles and wires and power lines and where your solution can integrate with um, standalone power systems. It's fantastic to see the work you've done with, with Deers and Marchmont Hill Consulting so far. Where, where do you plan on, on going in the next sort of three months? What are the next steps for you guys? Um, yeah, so um, uh, Tim could probably contribute a bit um, after I've done, but uh, yeah, so at the moment, we, we pretty much focused on, on kind of developing this consortium um, and, and really build, building this, this tool out. Um, so that's kind of a focus uh, as well as kind of continue the build um, in, uh, of, of, me, of the meter stack protocol. Um, so that's kind of the focus while I'll be in Australia. Obviously, we do have a lot of projects back in, back in South Africa that's also kind of keeping us busy. Um, but we, yeah, at the moment, my focus while I'm in Australia over the next few months is getting the arena funding on the back of this consortium proposal um, and helping to kind of deliver real value on the back of data um, as well as the, starting the build out of, uh, of the meter stack protocol. Fantastic. Um, I just wanted to remind the attendees again, as we've got some new people joining, 
um, feel free to drop any questions um, in the Q&A box down there or just some comments um, on your experience so far today. Um, Sorry, just wanted to, to add, Giles, there's, um, and just your point, Matt, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some really amazing opportunities which, which, um, which the data and, and which Metastack um, unlocks in the Australian market. You know, as Tim mentioned before, you know, we're really focused on, you know, how do we um, leverage our existing business into the Australian market and how do we use Metastack and customer data to also, you know, not, you know, unlock new opportunities, but also to change the way that, that a lot of the existing and the incumbents are, are, are using customers' data and are managing their, and, uh, and managing their utility businesses. And trying to take people through this journey to this digital utility is a, is a big focus, a big focus of ours. And just to, just to sort of reiterate the point that Sundar and, and Matt, Matt have made, and especially looking at these fringe of the grid opportunities, you know, there's, there's really no better time now um, then looking at these types of opportunities, given, you know, given the state of the world that, that we now live in. And, and you know, as, as Sundar has said, you know, the geographical spread of, of Australia has, um, has meant that really the cost of maintaining and operating the grids for a lot of the, the operators is becoming exponentially um, more expensive. And the development of you know, mesh networks, mini grids, micro grids, standalone power systems, DERs, is, uh, is really the future. For, 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 the, for the Australian energy market and to make it competitive and sustainable, which is really, really a, a key. I just want to add one thing. Um, I think another big opportunity, the fact that CDR is pretty developed in the Australian market at the moment across obviously the energy telecoms and banking sector. And to Matt's point, you know, there's still quite a lot that they're busy working on and a number of timelines, deadlines have been pushed out. If I just try and zoom out a bit, the fact that there hasn't been much traction is the biggest opportunity for us. It allows us to basically, as part of a consortium, perhaps validate a lot of the assumptions that they've been having from a regulatory and a policy perspective. And we could hopefully drive some real practical uh, infield experience and project experience part of a consortium to actually help them inform decisions that ultimately could shape the way that CDR is going to be operating in the energy sector. Thank you. I think that's a, a really good point to, to go on to ask Adam, actually, about your team, about your experience so far and um, how you can continue in that role in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Charles. I think, you know, um, as, as we mentioned in the introduction, you know, we are a vertically integrated digital utility in South Africa. And I suppose for all of those listening, you know, what that really means is that we operate from, from meter rollout and installation all the way up to billing vent support and, and metering operations. So in the Australian environment, we're looking at, at, at us performing the role of probably four or five market participants. And all of that is bundled into one, uh, into one target operating model, which we have. Um, in South Africa, currently we have 45 employees, uh, ranging from customer experience uh, all the way through to meter installation, asset uh, asset deployment, um, and metering operations. And really, the conveyor belt of our business is in uh, is in data. And you know, it's so it's it's over the years of experience that we've got um, developing smart metering projects, rolling out for for uh, commercial and for government, uh, a lot of government projects, dealing with vending and billing support, dealing with uh, metering operations and grid uh, and grid operations. We've got a real depth in our business across some really core areas um, that all sort of sit on top of, of uh, what we call, you know, sort of our data lake or our data conveyor belt. And really what we want to bring, and especially, I suppose if we unpack this into the CDR space, you know, our expertise in understanding, you know, what data means and the complexities of data and the complexities and the value of customer data go to the forefront. And then when you look on the other side, on, on the actual deployment side and the consortium with DS, we've got such deep operations experience and deployment experience. You know, our, our, our PMO and, and the projects that we've run, you know, we, we, um, we have about 12 um, very, very large projects over the, over the next um, sort of six to eight months where we'll be deploying over 40 or 50,000 meters. You know, that's a lot of customers which we have to engage with. That's a lot of data which we, we then understand and, and, and then to, to analyze. Thank you. I think, um, again, sort of leading on to that, um, when we talk about uh, the team and, and the way that you're set up in, in South Africa. It's a good question that we've just come in um, from Greg Brewer, who's asked, 
What is the next best alternative competitive threat to Eldo meter stack? What are complementary technologies that could make your solution adapt faster with utilities? Um, I'm just trying to think. Mm. So adding to that, Greg's mentioned that um, California and Hawaii are aggressively moving towards DERs and the use of analytics. Um, and do you have any plans in the US? I think we'll, we'll start with your initial, with Greg's initial question about um, your competitive threats um, and, and complementary technologies that could um, help you adapt faster. Uh, so there is one, one company in Australia that's, uh, that's kind of looking at a data marketplace um, for energy data, and that's uh, What Watches. Um, and that's the only company that we found that's looking at a similar sort of uh, um, uh, or trying to solve that, that data marketplace. They, they have taken a bit of a different approach to it um, and essentially kind of uh, put forward a platform where, where apps can kind of plug in on, on the back of energy data. They also have a, um, a device that you need to install at the home in order to kind of uh, start getting that data and collecting it. So we, we're trying to kind of differentiate ourselves in the marketplace by being device agnostic and, and collect, collecting data from a, a variety of, of hardware devices from meters to, um, to other devices like, like, like DS's power sensor um, and the like. So, so we, we are kind of differentiating ourselves to a certain extent in, in that regard. Um, in, ter in terms of the, the opportunity where, where we're looking at, um, uh, at, at standalone power systems in the fringe of grid areas, there, there are a couple of microgrid companies that are kind of doing it, um, but we, we're looking at, at really working with, um, with the, the distributors to kind of uh, help solve, solve the problem that they're currently facing. Um, they're looking for a turnkey solution and with, with the right consortium, um, uh, leveraging the right tools, I think uh, we'd be in a good place to kind of offer that. Um, there, yeah, so as I say, there are, there are companies doing different pieces um, of what we're trying to do but um, not, not the entire stack, so to speak. There's one other competitor I'd like to just to mention. Um, it's a company called Exergy based out of America. Um, and effectively they've built uh, a system on blockchain technology, but also it's linked to proprietary um, hardware. Effectively they've created a in-device um, meter, smart meter that um, does the encryption and the handshaking with a broader marketplace. So again, I think our biggest boon as Aldo is that we've built a business that um, relied on an open data acquisition methodology that allows us to integrate across different brands and meters. Um, and that's, I think, the only way that you can build a robust, scalable, and resilient data marketplace in the energy sector. The, the reality is we're rolling out 90 million smart meters a year globally, and you're not going to be replacing one of the incumbent large OEMs. Um, you're going to have data points in the in the industry and you may as well try and make use of those data points. So continue kind of like an open methodology of acquiring metadata. The marketplace definitely makes us fairly unique in the space across competitors. Yeah, and just to add to that, Tim, you know, if you look at, at our current protocol or the, or the, the current, um, um, you know, um, piece of meter stack, you know, our open device protocol is, is, um, is really um, internationally quite very unique. I mean, we integrate with a huge number of meter, meter types from, you know, water, electricity, gas, any type of uh, real, real sensor. Uh, whereas, you know, guys like uh, white watches and such, you, they, they're looking for proprietary um, te technology to be able to create their meter marketplace, which we think will be quite difficult for adoption and customer acquisition. Um, you know, for, for a marketplace where already there's really pretty low engagement for, for customers. You know, the, the key to this is getting customers to engage. And that brings me to my point really on, on CDR. Um, you know, if I look at some of the, big, the biggest barriers and the biggest opportunities come into what the ACCC and AMO are doing with, uh, with their legislation. And for me and, you know, a, a part of the consortium and the work we want to do with DS is making sure that we're on the forefront of the regulatory work and helping guide AMO and ACCC on their decision making with regards to CDI. And we've already, we've already submitted a number of uh, white papers and position papers to AMO and the ACCC, uh, you know, first of all, registering our interest in this 
initiative and now working towards hopefully getting uh, in partnership with this some type of uh, um, uh, engagement with AMO directly to look at how we can ingrain something like meter stack in, in the sort of the B2G business to government uh, framework, which will then uh, will really be a game changer in how, um, in how we can get people to engage with energy data. Um, just, yeah, just to just touch on that too. Um, we've obviously in, yeah, engaged uh, quite a lot with, with AMO and, and companies like Open Data Australia. Um, and they're both like very, uh, very much on the same page with us in terms of what the data rules should look like. Um, because the data rules should look different for energy um, as opposed to kind of uh, financial data. So they're definitely on the same page with, uh, with our thoughts around what, they, what the rules should look like. Um, and that was quite, quite encouraging to see um, as they think that our, our proposal could add a tremendous amount of value to the energy marketplace here in Australia. Whilst um, I still have um, a few questions from Greg Brewer, I thought I'd just move the conversation along so we can answer some of them. Uh, Greg's mentioned that um, he's happy to talk about these after the conversation, but we've got 10 minutes. So I thought I'd ask his second question here about um, plans in the US um, with California yeah. and Hawaii moving towards uh, the use of analytics and DERs. So we actually um, went on an energy program on the West Coast two years ago, and we met a whole bunch of energy stakeholders, regulators, accelerators. Um, we've had, had a discussion with a company called Utility API, uh, which basically specializes in um, data acquisition across different um, retailers, effectively in, in the US market. There's definitely some collaboration, some opportunity. Um, but also, we've got to remember that um, America has kind of pioneered this green button, uh, which allows customers um, through the regulator to basically share their energy uh, related data. I definitely do think there's a bigger opportunity in terms of data access rights and controls, um, as well as actually putting that data in the customer's hands, not um, through an incumbent or a centralized body. Um, so it is a very well developed market in terms of data access. Um, but we will continue to explore various options and we're obviously looking for various collaborations to test um, our marketplace and our platform and other markets. And we've now got time actually to, to go on to, to Greg's final question. Um, he is asking about um, your blockchain technology. He says, how does your blockchain tech comply with utility reg regulations or is that not relevant? Would you consider as a partner tech complementary add-on? Um, so we've actually, uh, Matt, I'll maybe start and then you can definitely chime in. Uh, we've initially actually looked at blockchain as a technology base for me to stack as a platform. Um, I mean, what goes without saying blockchain is very exciting, especially from a decentralization point of view. The bigger questions around scalability, reliability and cost, obviously factors that still need to be really determined with blockchain as the technology is, is very new and still very infant in terms of these larger scale database deployments. Um, so we're definitely open to the idea. We've done quite a lot of research, especially we start looking at sovereign identity and access control rights. Blockchain as a technology seems a natural fit, um, but we're still evaluating what is the right basis for us to um, deploy. Um, yeah, just to kind of add, add on to that, um, in, term, in terms we, we had kind of uh, looked at blockchain quite, quite a lot um, in kind of 2017, early 2018. Um, and that was kind of going to be quite a cornerstone of our technology stack. But as, as we kind of evolved and kind of went down the rabbit hole of blockchain, we realized it wasn't, wasn't quite the platform that we, we needed at the time. Um, so we decided to kind of focus on, on what was out there and, and, and kind of um, a existing scalable solutions right, right then. So that's kind of been the focus. Uh, but now, we, we are looking at, um, as Tim mentioned, uh, some things like self-sovereign identity in terms of data management and, and consumer, uh, consumer uh, information management. Um, so that's, and as well as looking at permissions around who has access to what data. Um, we, we see that self-sovereign identity could be a good, a good uh, use case for, for what we're trying to do. Um, so that's definitely at the forefront of our thinking right now. Thank you, Greg, for these, for these questions that keep coming through. Uh, we've got one more question coming through from Greg. Um, he's 
I, we mentioned this um, a bit earlier, Matt, when you were talking about um, opportunities with Arena and the uh, potential to partner with distributors. Greg has now asked um, if there is an opportunity to partner with utilities companies directly um, to improve their customer experience or service. Um, Adam, do you want to take this one? You, you broke up a little bit there, um, Giles. Okay, I can repeat the question. Uh, it's another one coming from Greg. It's about um, utilities companies. Um, and as they have um, this requirement or need to um, improve their customer experience and service, would they be interested in, in, would they be interested in partnering? And have you considered that avenue? Yes, absolutely. I think when we, when we look at the, the fringe, you know, the fringe of grid opportunities um, that we're doing with DS, um, you know, the, you know, it's, it is, it is a, it is a, it is a very important partnership. The difficulty really then comes down into the complexity of the data ownership and, um, and, and getting access to, to that data. You know, a lot of retailers and a lot of, a lot of um, stakeholders within the, the entire value chain, there is, it is quite unclear and uncertain of, of where the ownership of data sits and what, what retailers and what people are allowed to do with their data. You know, especially in the retail space, the, the data that, they, that they're receiving and what they're allowed to do with it, you know, around billing and, and, uh, and vend, you know, is, is, uh, is quite clearly, um, clearly regulated. You know, we really, you, you, you have to use the retailers to, to first get the engagement of the customers, get the trust of the customers. And then you and then you let the retailers use that data to to provide a better service because what's going to happen is if the retailers don't get on board early on and they don't show the customers that there is value in their data and that they need to be open to to um, the various opportunities of their data you're going to have a situation where where eventually other channels are going to open up for customers to understand and to see where the value of their data lies and then there are going to be other opportunities for other retailers to use that data for customer acquisition. So, yes, I do believe it is a big opportunity. I believe that, that retailers have to jump on it now because they need to build the trust now before they, their customers start to peel away uh, from, uh, from them uh, as they start to realize the, the value of their data. Um, yeah, so I just want to add, add there quickly because Adam raised a very good point, and that's trust. Trust is at the cornerstone of customer experience. And the fact that uh, data access rights in the utility and energy um, sector is fairly new, we believe that that's going to be the foundation for how utilities, retailers, and various stakeholders can build trust for their customers. The other thing that we hope to enable through MeterStack is not just create this layer of trust, but use the platform and the marketplace to also create financial incentives for the customers that should translate into bulk discounts or um, rebates on their current utility bills. So it's going to be a bi-directional marketplace that will actually also put some value back into the customer's pocket, literally. Um, and that hopefully on the back of a really robust trusted database and a trusted way of sharing um, data um, should hopefully increase customer experience and create new opportunities for uh, energy and utilities um, to provide other customer services. As we're entering the last sort of five minutes, uh, we can possibly extend this if there are more questions coming through. Um, but thank you very much to everyone who's watching so far. And please feel free to put your last questions in there. Um, I just like, Matt, uh, I'd just like to ask you um, if you could sort of summarize your learnings. I know we've been over it a bit, but just of the experience on the accelerator, um, what you would take out as the key things you've learned um, and will take forward. Oh, um, yeah, so it, I mean, the, the program has kind of been nonstop from the, from the get go. Um, we've met hundreds of different people um, from all different industries um, and experts and getting AMAs um, and, and engaging with a variety of people. And that's probably provided um, some of the most value that, that I, can, I can think of, uh, where, where someone would kind of give an idea and then you would need to kind of rethink one of your kind of potential assumptions that you that you've been kind of relying on so um, I think that's probably been the biggest kind of learning learning curve is that uh, like there's so many other people around here that that have have uh, contributions or, or, or knowledge um, sharing opportunities that can kind of contribute to uh, to you 
Um, and you you got to be willing to kind of adapt and kind of uh, adjust adjust your your positioning and your direction into into what's actually going to kind of lead to the most value creation at the end of the day. So I think it's yeah being hum humble enough to know to understand that you don't know everything. Um, and kind of take the learnings from from other people and, and kind of position yourself in the best possible light to to kind of uh, de deliver all, as much value as possible in the energy space. And obviously, you've had some really fruitful partnerships already with um, with DS and Marchmont Hill. Um, is there anyone in particular you'd like to to mention or thank um, at this at this stage? Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, we had had some great mentors in, in the likes of Charles Reddings and uh, um, uh, and uh, sorry, I've just gone blank. And uh, Neil Neil from Marchmont Hill and Sundar and Pete from Diaz. Um, and they were they were all kind of great help in in getting us to where we are. We also had the mentor Stuart Allianson. Um, and he provided a lot of direction and, and, um, and gave us a, a solid foundation around the understanding of the Australian marketplace. Um, so, yeah, they, and then all of the, all of the partners within, within um, the startup bootcamp um, and all of, the, all of the growth hackers uh, and the EIRs and the IRRs all added a tremendous amount of value. Um, from you contributing in terms of your research that you did for me, um, so I'm like grateful for, for everyone and everyone that contributed to this journey. Um, so it's been great. Um, well, Robert has just said that you guys have done an amazing job. So you're, you're doing a good job so far. Um, but looking, looking forward, what do you think are the key connections uh, that you'd like to make um, and key contacts going forward? Obviously, so much of the program is about those contacts. Uh, who are you looking to partner with next? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we are obviously looking for a distributor to partner with. Um, we have been engaging with the likes of Western Power and uh, Osnet Services as well as Essential Energy. We need one of them to be part of a consortium. So that's, uh, that's one of our key focus areas at the moment. But um, I think relationships like the one that we've established with DS is going to go on for, for years to come. I think there's um, a great, great fit um, uh, as we can kind of collaborate and kind of work together and, on solving a lot of problems. So I'm really looking forward to working with them over the coming, uh, coming years. And um, uh, yeah, as well as, uh, I mean, looking, looking at the different parties, I see, see Rob, Robert Ashdown's one of the attendees. He's, um, he's at a company called Tukio um, uh, out of Perth. And, uh, and we're also kind of working with them at the moment. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of different opportunities and a, a lot of different value propositions that we're kind of trying to kind of deliver on. Um, and Startup Bootcamp has really put us in a position to, to capitalize on, on all of these things. So um, I'm quite excited about the future and, and, and the relationships that we've already established. I just wanted to add to that, Matt. You know, first of all, like, thank you. I mean, thanks to you, Matt. I mean, what you've done and, and the work that you've done has been incredible. I was lucky enough to be a part of this. And, you know, thanks to Tim you know, such an inspirational leader. I mean, I think that as a team, it's been such an amazing um, experience and I've certainly um, grown and developed so much um, through the program. You know, just to touch on something you mentioned, Giles, and something that is quite important. And, you know, Matt mentioned some of the other opportunities that we're looking at. You know, I think that the difference that we have, Giles, as a business is that because we have a deep vertical stack, a product stack and software stack already, and we're, and we're already looking into the Australian energy market as, an, as, a, as a standalone Aldo existing business, what MetaStack and, and what we are developing with MetaStack and the, and the real, ex, another exciting dynamic is that all of the relationships that we build and all of the partnerships or all of the projects that we are, that we are that we're going to initiate into Australia will always have a, a part of MetaStack um, as a component as, um, in that, as we, because irrespective of um, AMO or ARENA, we will be building the MetaStack protocol into our existing stack. And through our other partnerships and through other initiatives, we'll be educating and leveraging the, the customer experience and leveraging customers into, into um, into the meter stack, uh, into a version or versions of our meter stack platform to slowly test what the customer's engagements look like, to educate customers, to deepen our understanding of 
of engagement and what engagement means. So, you know, the, the really exciting thing for me is that we have these amazing opportunities and, you know, what we're going to be doing with, you know, Dias and, uh, and Sundar and the guys on the fringe of the grid opportunities, the stuff that we're doing with, with uh, Tukio and looking at like directly in the, in the energy retail space. They all can draw on, on what Metastack is as this agnostic marketplace and platform. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really exciting to see that we can embed something like Metastack into our overall global business. I think the, the, the point to wrap up on there, um, Adam, is that there really is so much to look forward to um, as you continue this journey in Australia. Um, I think that this is a great point, uh, a great time to, to direct people back towards the website. Uh, I've just posted the link in the chat. So if you'd like to go and connect with anyone at Eldo Meter Stack, um, just click the connect button um, at the top right hand page of their, uh, of their profile. Uh, you can also watch this recording back in full to um, get a full view of any questions that you might have missed during the session. Uh, but thank you very much to everyone who's attended today. We hope you got a lot out of the demo day experience and the, the Q&A. Um, and thanks to you three as well for joining me today. Um, well, especially Tim and Adam all the way from South Africa and, and Matt back in our Melbourne office. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Giles. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been great working with you and, uh, and thanks for hosting this. I think you uh, covered everything that we wanted to and um, look forward to, to what lies next. Well, we look forward to it. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Giles. Appreciate the opportunity. Until, take care. Cheers, guys.